So what excites me is getting off planet, not because I want to leave Earth. No, 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 no. We need to use space technology to help save life on Earth, to protect the environment. This is a garden It's a place where we live. We don't need to foul our homes. I think we need to be developing the capability to get energy from space, these step of fossil fuels, things like space solar power. I think we ought to look to space for helping us solve the climate crisis by perhaps sunshades at the Earth Sun L1 to help offset climate change to temperature increases. And I think we ought to start moving the industry and mining off the world so that we can no longer damage the nest that we're being. Welcome to Culturescape, the show that interviews the geek creators and influencers that built nerd culture. If you're watching or listening to this, there is a strong case that you are into science fiction, and I'm sure you've imagined stories about traveling to other worlds with concepts like faster than light travel, the concept of generation ships and antimatter drives, and of course, things like solar sails. It makes you ask the question, but what would it really take for us to get to a distant planet like Mars, or perhaps something much farther away like Alpha Centauri? Well, today's guest is a scientist, futurist, and author. He's also one of the world's foremost experts on solar sails. His latest project with Bain Books is an anthology uh, collection exploring these ideas titled Humanity's Hope for a Better Future at a New Star. And separate from on top of all that, he is also a scientist for NASA, which is unaffiliated from his book and other projects. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, uh, Mr. Les Johnson. Thanks for having me, Peter. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I, I greatly appreciate it. researching your work, seeing what you've done. You're, you have quite an impressive resume. Um, I, I Forgive me because I'm probably going to ask a lot of those really stupid questions you probably get all the time. So, uh, so I hope you'll hold in there. I don't think I'll run away and flee. And I, I don't view any question as stupid because if you don't know the answer, it's a good question, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's how people learn. Okay. So let's start here. Tell us about uh, your book. Well, sure. Uh, the title of the book is actually the Ross 248 Project. I have a copy of it here. Uh, Humanity's Hope for a Future at a New Star is kind of the subband to that. And it's, it's really... Uh, it's a collection of short stories and nonfiction essays by various science fiction writers, many of whom, if you're uh, listening to this great science fiction, we're going to be familiar with some of these writers. Some are new. Um, and it really is trying to answer the question, you know, if you go to all the trouble to travel to another star, which I've written about in some of my books, and I can talk about some of those a little bit later, but if you're going to go to all that trouble and, and, and undergo the massive effort it's going to take to send people from here across light years of space, Chances are you're going to get to a planetary system that will not have an already available, ready to inhabit Earth 2.0. Uh, that's only in Star Trek, right, where they get the M-class planets, or in Star Wars, where every planet is optimized for people, uh, at least that are in the stories. In all likelihood, the worlds would be very different. They'll be like Mars, they'll be like Venus. There might be some that are like Earth was a billion years ago. Um, and, and we'll either have to adapt ourselves or we'll have to do something like terraforming, where we take that world and potentially shape it to be something that, that people can survive on. So I, I, this, this, this story collection is trying to realistically look and entertain uh, the reader with you know some of the scenarios that we might face uh, when we get somewhere and it's not immediately habitable. You know, can, can the people who've made that voyage undertake probably a centuries long endeavor to make it 2.0 of Earth, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the challenges that they'll have and the struggles that they'll handle. I think the, the the collection is fascinating. It reminds me of um, older science fiction stories. You look at stuff back in the 30s and 40s where they were trying to imagine what space travel might look like. And I'm totally into that. I love that uh, middle of the century uh, science fiction. Uh, so you, in your day job, when you're not moonlighting as an author, you are a scientist for NASA, correct? That's right. Yeah, I do advanced in space propulsion, which is a fancy way of saying I do what happens. I, I get the spacecraft, uh, try to come up with ways to get spacecraft faster across deep space. You know, rockets, talk about mid-century. Rockets are last century, man. Uh, that's how we get off the ground and get to space, but they're terribly inefficient pound for pound. What you need is you need things that are thousands of times more efficient to get thrust than a rocket to be able to cover 
you know, millions of miles, if not billions and trillions of miles quickly. And I work on the next generation of propulsion systems for use in space that'll take our spacecraft faster and farther than ever before. So that's that's what I've spent most of my career working. Yeah, it's solar sails is a concept that, uh, can you explain that a little bit to readers that might not be familiar? Oh, sure, sure. Um, you may not realize it, but when you're outside on a sunny day or you're, you're, you're in your house listening and watching this video cast podcast and the lights are on, uh, the light source, whether it be the light in your room uh, or the sun, is emitting particles of light called photons. Now, these photons are discrete little particles, and they have momentum. They don't have rest mass, but they do have momentum. So you can think of them as like little BBs that are bouncing off of you. And as they bounce off of you, they impart some of that momentum to you. And, and the best analogy really is a sailing ship on the ocean, right? You put the big mm -hmm. sail up on a mast, the wind blows. As the wind reflects from a sail, it pushes on the sail. The sail's attached to your sailing ship by this big mast, and it drags your ship with it, right? Well, the light in the room or the light outside on a sunny day is reflecting from you and it's pushing. Now, compared to the wind, it's a very, very small push. In fact, if you were to go out at noon on a sunny day, low humidity, humidity and the sun is right over mid, the amount of force of sunlight on two football fields of area is the same as you would feel holding a quarter and a nickel in your hand. Not much force. But when you get out of Earth's gravity, and away from the atmosphere, and you're in space, Newton's laws work really, really well. And as this light reflects from this large, lightweight, reflective sail that looks like a big, lightweight sheet of aluminum foil, it's going to push on it constantly. The sun's always shining in space, right? And that constant acceleration can take a spacecraft at very high speeds, can make it very efficient, pound for pound, at doing deep space craft. So uh, we're, we're working on this capability. It's been demonstrated in low Earth orbit. Uh, the Japanese flew a demonstration in deep space back in 2010. NASA and our mind leadership, uh, technically for the sale, launched one last November on the Artemis One launch as a secondary payload. But unfortunately, like many of the secondary payloads on that flight, there were 10 small spacecraft that were flown there. Um, our spacecraft never called home, so it never had a chance to deploy the sail or demonstrate it. If things had been working as they were supposed to be working, I would be in the mission operations center right now, uh, helping the sail navigate its way to an asteroid. But we're trying to recover from that and come up, get another demonstration put together so that we can actually start using solar sails for small spacecraft uh, in space for science purposes in the future. So we'll look at them. One of the problems, I believe, with solar sails, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, is that uh, as we understand them, that they may not be like, the best option for if you're trying to you know get humans to travel through space but they are great for smaller craft is that do i have that about right that's right and that's because of the technological limitations we have right now remember i mentioned that it took a uh, an area equivalent to two football fields to get just basically the middle of force as a quarter <laughs> the exerts in the palm of your hand and when you do that and you think about okay everybody eyes don't glaze over we're gonna do a little math if i had a whiteboard i'd draw it on there i'd get my my jacket out that has a patch on the sleeve so I look like a university professor, right? Here we go. Force equals mass times acceleration. F equal MA. That equation's got a balance. And at any distance from the sun, if this is my sail and the light's reflecting from it, there's a certain amount of force on that area, right? And it's fixed because the sunlight's constant. It's shining on it. And what that means is for the spacecraft that's attached to that sail to start moving, it's got to get acceleration. And you want that A to be large. People are having nightmarish visions of, of middle school algebra at this point. What you want is that A to be large, and that means in order to balance the equation, the M, the mass term, has to be small. And right now, we can only build sails of a certain size, and therefore, we can only get so much acceleration out of them, which means we can't really use small space. Now, in the future, with better materials, we might be able to do like they do in Star Trek, Star Wars, I think one of the Star Wars movies, they had a they had a solar sail on an evil guy's mm -hmm. ship, Doug Cooper or something like that. By the way, it was a poor design. It was a black sail. I could double the efficiency immediately by making it more reflective. But they didn't consult me in the room until they should have. Um, so what you want to do in the future is you might have sails that instead of, you know, thousands of square feet in area, they might be square miles. 
in air. And then we can attach human spacecraft to it. But for now, we can't build anything that big, so we have to use small space. Yeah, yeah, that's that's almost that's mind boggling to me to imagine a spacecraft that's miles long. But yeah, it, it seems like for a lot of the projects, especially if you want to travel outside our solar system, you would have to have something with uh, maybe not necessarily that big, but it has to have a huge amount of capacity. Well, yeah, the spacecraft wouldn't have to be that big. That's how big the sail would be. Uh, to, just to give you an example, uh, the one we launched back in November had it deployed. The spacecraft was the size of two loaves of bread, okay? But the sail was the length of a school bus on each side, okay? And in the middle of that sail was the spacecraft, and it was the size of two names of bread. Uh, we're working on one now. It's called Solar Cruiser, where the spacecraft is about the size of a, uh, a large garbage can. Okay, one of the big, you know, gallon, 50 gallon drone garbage cans. But the sail is almost 20,000 square feet. Okay, so it, it's, you know, the floor area of Home Depot. <laughs> so, you know, the spacecraft can be smaller than the sail in area, but those sails are really thin because they have to be lightweight. So they're thinner than a human hair. They're about two and a half microns a dick. So, yeah, and wow. if we were in person, I'd have a sample I could hand to you. You could handle it, it's pretty robust. But it's extremely lightweight. It's it's pretty amazing stuff. You were you were working on the the tech that will be a huge part of you know interplanetary space travel in the future. It's it's kind of fascinating to me to talk to you because you're at, you're an actual scientist. You're an actual person that's working on these projects. You know that maybe not you know my day, but you know my kids or grandkids day. This stuff is going to enable them to, you know, to travel to who knows where, you know, Pluto or beyond. I think we're going to go to the stars with a sail. In fact, um, my recent nonfiction book that came out last fall from Princeton Press, I've got the cover back here, it's called Traveler's Guide to the Stars. It's a nonfiction book that talks about how we might really go to the stars. And in the book, I go through a lot of the advanced propulsion options that I've looked at over my career. Things like fusion, uh, fusion drive, antimatter, uh, wormholes, all those kind of things, and, and kind of given my assessment of what's the most realistic thing you might be able to do. And I believe it'll be a, uh, a descendant of a solar shape, the sails we're working on now, that will be propelled not just by sunlight, but by high energy lasers. I think we'll have big lasers out in space that are like gigawatt class lasers that will shine really bright light on the sails to accelerate and faster and faster out of the solar system. Well, I think that's how we'll send our first floor body from to another star um, in a reasonable trip time, which I mean a few hundred meters, not tens of thousands. So I, I can see that happening in, in your kids' life easily. Not with people. It'll be a robotic probe. But I think the first interstellar robotic probe you think be launched within the next few years. That's, yeah. It's really exciting stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you have a very cool field that you work at. So help help people help myself and the listeners here. So what are the the logistical hurdles that it would take for us to go from our planet to a place like Mars with humans uh, evolved in that equation? Because I think a lot of us have this this in our heads we're thinking you know, just like the lunar missions. Uh, you know you have a rocket, you have the multi piece part, you get to the moon, you come back. Yeah, it's not as simple as that, right? Well, the, the moon, we were able to put everything on a single rocket and launch it at one time. And, and that made it a lot easier. Um, so the, the, the rocket that carried the astronauts to and from the moon was on the Saturn V. Uh, the lander that took them to the surface and back up from the surface to the rocket that brought the phone was on the same launch. And you didn't have to do in orbit assembly of anything. You just had to do a rendezvous in your orbit, which was pretty hard in 1969, right? Uh, but they did it. Uh, to go to Mars is a lot more complicated. Uh, Mars is much farther away, and you have to have a lot more energy to get there in a reasonable amount of time, which means you need a lot bigger rockets, a lot more propellant. Uh, you have to send enough supplies, not just for a week trip like we did to the moon, but realistically, trips to Mars are going to be round trip at best with years. So you've got to send a habitat large enough to keep your crew uh, able to move around, exercise, uh, get away from each other. I don't know about you, but 
I can't imagine being locked in the Winnebago with my three best friends for three years. I mean, someone would not lie. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're probably not going to be your three best friends by the no, time that's right. Done. So people are going to need, you know, their own space. They're going to need places to exercise, that kind of thing. So the vehicle has to be not huge, but it has to be, you know, something like the space station where people stand here, bring your talent. And, and we've gotten used to doing it. But it's pretty big. And in order to move that to the speeds you need to get to, to get to them for longer, you have to have a pretty big propulsion system. Now, we could do that with chemical rockets today in that three-year return, but you would have probably, you know, five to ten launchings of big rockets like the Starship or NASA's big launch system, filled totally with just rocket propulsion that you would put together in stages up in space like Tinko Toys and burn through the fuel, and after you've used that to throw away one of those stages, and you go to Mars, and have your land, or come back up, and have more stages to come back. Now, we could do that chemically, and, and we probably could have done that in the 70s. Uh, the problem is, you know, understanding biological effects of people in deep space over three years, the space radiation environment, keeping them alive, the technology to do a land, or not just go down to a small moon, but a planet, right? and safely bring people back up to space from that planet. So you'd have to build you know, a rocket designed to lift off from another world, which we've really not done much of here. Um, and it's all doable. I, I think it's just a matter of, of resources and will at this point to do it with existing tech. Now, if you if you want to use less propellant, fewer launches make it less complicated. You, you use what's called a nuclear thermal rocket. And these are doable. We've tested one in the world in the U.S. and way back in the 60s. There were a project that was put on the shelf. It was Project Nerva at the time. And there's a lot of interest in reviving that. There are some funded projects within the U.S. government uh, to do that. And basically, a nuclear reactor, driven spacecraft, and nuclear thermal rocket, instead of using the energy of chemical combustion, you flow the fuel over a hot nuclear reactor that like generates power at your local nuclear power plant. And what that does is it super keeps the exhaust, which provides essentially twice the thrust per panel of fuel. So you can cut your fuel load in half uh, if you have a nuclear thermal rocket. Now, that nuclear thermal rocket wouldn't be used to get from the surface of the Earth to space. You use a conventional rocket for that, for safety reasons. Uh, you wouldn't use the nuclear stage until you were safely out of space, away from the Earth, so there's no risk to your really fire up, go to Mars, and come back. Uh, that would reduce the trip time a little bit, but its biggest payoff is it reduces the amount of mass you have to launch. And then at, at you know five to ten thousand pounds of dollars per pound of payload, that's expensive. All that you will launch. So we could do it today also with nuclear rockets. So I think a Mars mission, I see that happening. Maybe you know while I'm still you know walking on the planet, I think it's uh, the first humans to, to go set foot on the planet and do exploration. It's new. Just a matter of do we want to do it where we're willing to pay to it? Yeah, that, that's kind of what I get too. It feels like that that is a totally doable thing, except it feels like, and I'd love to hear your your thoughts on this since you are a science fiction writer on top of a scientist. It feels like the, the cultural obsession or the interest uh, in the US around the world for uh, projects like that, space travel, it seems quite a bit dimmed, even from like my parents' day. It's so it's like these things are doable, but it, you know you have to get the funding, you have to get the permission, you have to be able to make it happen. And uh, I don't know, I don't know. That that seems like a tricky thing to try to maneuver. Why do you think that is? Why do you think, although we have a huge cultural interest in like science fiction, there isn't the same kind of buzz for things like NASA, like rocket propulsion, like the projects that you're working on. Which, so that's a hard one to answer. I think there are a lot of pressing problems that we have, right, uh, in our societies that, that people are more concerned about. Um, and it's hard to, you know, prioritize, you know, feed the hungry dirt bars, right? I don't, I don't think it's that simple a dichotomy because the amount of money that is spent on space exploration is extremely small compared to the rest of the budget. I think NASA gets something on the order of three tenths of one percent of the federal budget. It's, it's very, very small. Um, and space exploration in the world probably was just, you know, even a fraction of that compared to global GDP. So you, you could eliminate all space exploration and you, you still had it was it's not going to go away. Um, that said, what we gain from this is huge. Our understanding of our own planet, we'll learn more by studying the biosphere of another planet, 
potential biosphere. We don't listen to it. We'll be there. Uh, but the, the environment of the major planet. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of um, science for the sake of science. Because as we learn more and more about the universe, it lets us better understand ourselves and it lets us develop technologies that improve the quality of life on Earth. Uh, you know, I'm looking at your your office there and probably looking at mine. Most of the innovations that we have in our everyday life came from fundamental science, not on um, it's just some you know, economic bridge for our investment in the It's just what happens in the what's on there, what's over there. And our ancestors from all over the world, whether you're Polynesian, uh, you know, you left some continent and, and sailed out into the oceans and settled the Polynesian islands because you had some ancestors and you wanted to go explore and settle out on the planet, right? Um, and, it, you know, the Chinese have done that, the Europeans have done that, we've all, all cultures have done that. And I think we're at the edge of that sea now. It's time to, you know, set sail and see what there is to learn and what there is to do. I also don't think people realize how integral space technology is to your everyday life. If you were to ask a person on the street, you know, how would your life be affected if all the space satellites were? Most people would have trouble telling you how they would be adversely affected instead of all. When in fact it would be transcribed. That's um, a great point. You, you would have, you know, your GPS for your phones and navigating. You wouldn't be able to do that. You'd have to go back to the map, which a lot of people don't want to do. Uh, your active wind forecast will go out the window. Uh, forecasting and, and understanding hurricanes and severe weather is going to strike would be dollar. Uh, be, you, you wouldn't have the instantaneous communication that we have that brought us here. King Charles's uh, coronation, those events, these events coming out of Ukraine and South Asia, you know, globally around the world, banks transfer money via satellite instantly in the currency markets. Uh, if, you, if you go to the local gas station and look on the roof, there's a satellite there. And, and that satellite dish isn't for people to sit in the break room and watch the great TV. It's because they do all of their credit checks to credit cards on secure satellite. The internet's not secure. And so if the satellite goes down, you can't buy anything on your credit card. And some of these gas stations or food stores or Walmart, uh, inventory management stuff. The supply chain with trucks are all routed by GPS and satellite inventory control. So, and that's not even the military aspects of it. You know, watching what the other people are doing to make sure that they're not in a surprise attack or something, which helps keep the peace. And, and I think this... The space infrastructure moved people with like, well, space is not relevant. It was like, well, yes, it is. <laughs> you use it every day and you don't realize you use it. Your modern life depends on it. And you have no idea how bad it would be if we lost access to space. And so this, this evolution of people in space, space mining, lunar exploration, lunar cell, system lunar, you know, industrial development for resources that are scarce on Earth, space solar power. All of those things are ultimately going to benefit us here on the ground, and it's going to come from exploration and development. So I, I'm not, you know, I'm not a shy wallflower about that. <laughs> of course, and, and and I really believe we need to shout it from the root. Yeah, nor should you be a wallflower. Uh, uh, one of the great points, uh, a previous interview guest we had, Patrick Chillas, who I believe is another author for Bain. He made the point that a lot of the research and things we know in the realm of prosthetics, a lot of that actually came out of the space program, which was a bit of a surprise to me. I didn't, I didn't quite um, understand that. But when you really look down to what the space race and research in the space has given us, I mean, so many of our advances in computing just came out of the projects in the '60s. There, there. While it doesn't feel like it's directly beneficial programs at NASA. You know, down the line, someone takes the ideas you guys come up with, uh, uses them for some kind of engineering application, then we all are the beneficiaries of that. And again, it's also, fortunately, a uh, dual feeding path here in that we might have some innovation that industry goes out and uses, but the scale at which industry uses them, dollar value for the industry does dwarfs what space budget is. And so an innovation or an invention for NASA goes out in the private sector, gets billions of more dollars of investment, gets mass produced and truck, and then we make use of it in our next generation spacecraft. And, and, you know, you gave the right example of computer. Uh, computers really uh, advanced dramatically, uh, basically in World War II for prototype um, And then again, in the 50s and 60s, during the space race, uh, the, the military needed them. For military purposes, and NASA needed it for space exploration. 
So it was advanced and then the industry took over and made it faster and cheaper and spent hundreds of billions, about trillions of dollars to miniaturize it to get this little guy here, you know, your phone. And now NASA turns around and says, oh, good, we're going to use the technology from this phone to make our satellites small and way less so that my solar sail can now take a spacecraft to a new destination because the spacecraft works, right? So it, it's a cycle. And, and what we learn from the missions that I'm trying to enable, they come back and help us do things commercially that we can't even do. And that's the cycle of innovation and commercialization that really works well. Uh, it's a government industry partnership, and it, and it has worked well in this country. Now, I'm a libertarian, generally, so I like private ventures uh, more. You know, that's kind of, I feel like the the economy, the power of the invisible hand can lead to things that uh, are just impossible for government. However, there is something to say about having a program like NASA, have doing what you do versus, you know, what we see at SpaceX. Um, what do you think that you can do and NASA can do better than, say, SpaceX can? Why do you think we need both or perhaps why not? Well, I'm a big advocate and a big fan of SpaceX, Blue Origin, and the commercial launch providers. I think what a lot of people don't realize is NASA got out of the commercial launch of the main thing was back in 1988 after the challenge of the And so long before SpaceX, we were paying private industry to launch our enemy rockets. Uh, but we sent a spacecraft to Mars or otherwise, it's a commercial launch provider, commercial industry. I was hadn't been since the 80s. Uh, what, what Elon has done and what uh, Bezos is trying to do is up in the business model and, and come up with ways with reusability and production and whether they do development and test to make it a lot less expensive and more affordable, which is in fashion. It lets us our dollars to a lot farther. So, so first of all, I don't think there is competition. I think it's, I mean, we, we always repeated our, not always, throughout my entire career, I think, uh, we have always had economic competition with private industry and lots of people. Okay. And um, I think that's a great way, and that's the way it should continue. The way I see what we do is, uh, for, first off, for science, where there is no economic return, things like the you know, James Webb Space Telescope, which is giving us, you know, views of the universe never before we've seen, there's no economic return for that. that. Right now, that's just science. And so I can't see the marketplace saying, oh, let's go build a James Webb Space Telescope for billions of dollars, you know, to see what's out there. I don't think that would necessarily happen because there isn't necessarily a market for that. However, the James Webb Space Telescope was built in partnership between NASA scientists and engineers on the industry. There were contractors who looked at He told them innovated the technology that went into the telescope. The work that I do, we're developing a solar sail. My goal is after we fly this first sail missions with an asteroid or whatever, I get out of the business. And the companies that work with me in taking the technology license it, and then they go market it in the commercial marketplace uh, and let that invisible hand take over to market it and, and let it go fly and get more efficient and more fast to go to the missions that, uh, say, a mining company or a letter communications company wants to use the city. So I, I view us as kind of the, uh, the front end of innovation and development. And uh, we partner with industry and industry runs off and that's the job. And one of the interesting things that I this you when I was listening to a, a TEDx talk that you did in getting ready for this interview, you made this fabulous point that um, until really 1992, we didn't really know too much about the planetary bodies outside our own solar system. You know, it's a reminder that you know, you know, I hear this sometimes where people are like, "Well, why are we spending all this money on NASA?" I mean, look at everything that was promised and how you know how. A uh, few miles we've made in the realm of progress, but but when I look at you, I hear you uh, do the TEDx lecture, read your book. A good point that you do make is that we are just so in the beginning of all this stuff. I mean, if you think of, you know, we first get the first rockets, you know, to get, you know to get off the Earth end of the 1950s, in the 60s. Uh, don't we we are only beginning to understand. The planetary bodies outside our solar system i mean we're just so much in the beginning what, what does that mean to you exactly when you think about where we're at with this tech and where do you think it could be potentially going and what excites you about the future of uh space research and the kind of work that you do well that's a lot rolled into one i, I guess the best analogy i have come up with or where we are in our development is if you look back at the history of human exploration on the planet Earth, 
from what we spread out of you know the Middle East and Africa and basically people spread out all over the world from there um to rockets and space station and their global. I would compare the state of technology we are today from interstellar travel on that, you know, relative to where those first explorers were we in it. <laughs> So we're trying, we're figuring out how to put something in the water and go a few miles downstream of our hats by floating downstream. Okay. I'm not even sure we have a paddle in our canoe right now. So with regard to, you know, to, to, you know, to make that comparison from out of Africa to the space station, you know, our, our status for getting to Alpha Centauri is we're in a canoe floating down. Okay. It's going to be a while before we have steamships. Uh, uh, you know, electric power engines, nuclear submarines, you know, the rockets and, and spaceships to, to get to Alpha Centauri. That said, um, it is a super exciting. This is the most exciting time for space exploration in my lifetime since I was born in 1962. Uh, I was uh, seven years old when Neil Armstrong walked up and I remember my parents waking me up. It was late at night. It was 11 o'clock. Uh, I was on a little black and white television. Imagine that, a grainy black and white television. I was probably wearing little footy pajamas, right? And I got to watch this historic event. I had no idea what was happening uh, until afterwards when I got all excited in that space. The people that are making the innovations happen today, that are making space exciting and accessible, are the billionaires who are my generation who saw that when they were children and said, I'm going to help make that move forward. And they got money. And they're doing it, right? They're making it more affordable and more economic. So I view this as an echo space. Event. I think this is the most exciting time in space development since 1968. So uh, if we play it right, it'll continue. Uh, my big fear is that it's dependent on the personality of the people who run these companies. And if something happens to them, then it all just kind of dies. We have to institutionalize this revolution, get companies that can find a way to make a profit. So the people will keep doing it like we do with communications and GPS and all the things I mentioned previously, so that the expansion of humans into the self system Um, so what excites me is getting off planet, not because I want to leave Earth. No, 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 no. We need to use space technology to help save life on Earth, but protect the environment. This is a garden plan. It's a place where we live. We don't need to foul our homes. I think we need to be developing the capabilities for energy from space instead of water fossil fuels, things like space solar power. I think we ought to look to space for helping us solve the climate crisis by perhaps sunshade instead of the Earth Sun L1 to help offset climate change with temperature increases. And I think we ought to start moving the industry and mining off the world so that we can no longer damage the, the nest that we're in. Um, so I envision a future in a few hundred years where we're getting clean energy from space, our, our resources for our electric infrastructure are not coming from Africa and children being forced to work in mines to get cobalt uh, for Chinese, you know, battery manufacturers, but we're getting it from asteroids uh, and, and we're powering our economy and energy from space. So I have a, a very uh, glass hat full utopian uh, view of what the future can hold for us if we put our minds to it. I think this is a very exciting time to be alive. My dad is a huge uh, space buff, NASA buff. He's really into all this stuff. So that's kind of why I'm a bit more familiar than the average person. So, like the idea that we we already have commercial space travel on some level. Uh, it, it's not, I mean, we're not traveling to the moon yet, but it, it is. You can get off of uh, Earth's basic atmosphere, so that's pretty good. Um, you know, we are looking at the commercialization of like maybe mining asteroids. Uh, maybe we can do even there are projects I know going on in the Antarctic. They're looking at like, okay, so how could we possibly make a colony on the moon work? You know, how could we meet those um, conditions? So that's all super exciting. I mean, I really am excited to see what we are capable of doing in the future. However, like you point out, part of the problem with uh, space research, this area, you know, we're trying to to make the dreams of tomorrow reality now is that the the just the astronomical uh, numbers of money that you have to do, have to work on these projects. It's <laughs> no, let's put this into perspective. No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, it's expensive. Doing anything is expensive. I, I, I would say that if you go out and you get in your car and you drive across town, uh, every mile of interstate is like a million dollars to build these days. 
or bridge. Okay. Uh, that bridge that you drive across the river, that was probably $10, $15 million bridge to build. Uh, anything we do that's a big infrastructure takes some money. Uh, space exploration with space projects are not that much more expensive than other things we do as a society. They really are. Uh, the, the comparison I like to give is, uh, and this is way out there, because the U.S. budget has gotten much larger than when I first did this. Um, if, if you take uh, a, a bag of pennies, okay, and you say each penny is worth a billion dollars with a B, okay? NASA stacks up 23 pennies, okay? And then you dump out a bag full of pennies, each representing a billion dollars for the rest of what the U.S. government spends money on. And you're dumping out about 5,000 pennies, okay? Compared to NASA's 23. So I have to I have to challenge the assertion that it's astronomically expensive. It isn't. It is expensive for you and me. I don't know what a billion dollars is. I have no idea. That's unfathomable to me. My retirement savings are you know you know like this. However, in the scope of what government does, they could eliminate NASA completely and it would make no difference in our budget deficit at all. Practically speaking, uh, it would just be not even noticed. It would be error in the ground. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry to, to jump on you about that. Oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. I, I, I want to hear your take on really this, your opinion. Well, to realize this, the scope, we don't get any NASA. I won't say we cannot speak as an outside person. I'm looking at all the data. You can look at NASA's budget up there now. N NASA doesn't get anywhere close to what other federal programs get. It uses God. And, and it does as much as it can with a little. And I, I think it's a lot for you and me. I'm not trying to make light of the fact that a billion dollars is real money. But in, in the context of, of the massive loss of money that we spend on other things, it, it's a small fraction of what we do as a society. My, my point that I was trying to get to is that the work you do, places like SpaceX, it's really dependent on the whims of, of either the, peop the people who either hold the purse strings or people who are billionaires, you know, uh, Elon Musk, Peter Thiel types. And so I can't fund our own space program. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to happen. You're exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So it, there is always that concern when you're so reliant on personalities, or you have to keep, you know, you have to go keep with wherever the tides take you. I mean, that that makes people like you your job a bit more difficult because you're like you want reliable funding. You want to know that the project you're working on tomorrow, today, you'll be able to try and to complete tomorrow. And, and that's been difficult. Um, because uh, it, it's just difficult to sustain funding across uh, presidential administrations and across Congresses, because they all are responsive to their electorate and the people who elected them and have their own priorities, and that guides how they tell the federal agencies to spend them on. And again, in the private sector, you know, you've got the whims of what the CEOs of these companies want to do with their money. Right? Um, so you're exactly right. For something like this, unless you're independently wealthy like those folks, which most of us are not, uh, you really are at the whims of other people's decision making in terms of spend. So hopefully, it has. I mean, it has been a blessing to have something like uh, SpaceX. I mean, it, that is a good thing. That is a that is a positive change. But you know, it, that doesn't completely solve the issue or the concerns that you guys have. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Les. Uh, how does one become a, a scientist slash book author. What what was your journey uh, to becoming this uh, very interesting person that you are? Well, I appreciate you being interested in what I do. I have to tell you, I, I feel uh, truly blessed. Um, I, I'm a person of faith, and I feel like I've been safer because I've I've had a good, uh, good health, uh, loving, committed spouse, my kids uh, support what I do. Uh, I have uh, parents who evaluated in education. We didn't have a lot of money. My father died when I was in high school. I had to get a job or work or hard to get the grades to go to school. But after that, Neil Armstrong loved it. And then my older sister had me uh, let me stay up late to watch Little Rounds on Star Trek, the original series. I was back in Bruce, uh, going across the, the galaxy. I knew I wanted to do something associated with space just based on exploration. I started reading every science fiction novel I could get my hands on. And I decided I wanted to be a scientist. And I didn't really know what a scientist did at the time, but by golly, I wanted to be one because I knew I'd never get astronaut because I had glasses that were as quick as models when I was, you know, a teenager. 
Uh, so yeah, I couldn't be a file over anything like that. So the astronaut thing is never ran into any of mine. Um, and so I, I got good scholarships. I went to a good liberal arts college in Kentucky, H. Pennsylvania University, and originally from Appalachia in Stitchon. I went to Vanderbilt for graduate school, um, applied to NASA, did a job at NASA all the while reading science fiction. Uh, the person who funded my graduate research at Vanderbilt had an opening here at NASA Marshall in Alabama, and I applied. I thought it would be a good spot to get that job, and he didn't hire me. Darn it. Uh, so I had to take my lumps, uh, and I ended up working for a contractor that was doing defense space research. It was Ronald Reagan's Star Wars defense effort at the time, and learning aids. But my heart was never in defense. I mean, defense is fine. It's why we do it. I go to questions about helping teach it. They said it's just about all my heart was. Mm -hmm. And an opportunity uh, a little bit later to get into the so I did. Well, I've been there over 30 years, so I have a wonderful career. I worked me on advanced tech, and some light experiments, some of the successful, some not. That's a really fascinating, some of the smartest people in Weber be all over the world. And all the while, I uh, kept going to science fiction conventions. Uh, I don't put on Spock either or dress up like a dress as a, you know, a NASA guy. <laughs> um, but but I love science fiction, and I got to meet some of my favorite writers that I read the books when I was a kid and an adult. Okay, okay. People like Ben Bova were the greatest here in my home. I had a dinner with Larry Ed, and Jerry Cornell. I got to meet some of the greats. And um, about 15 years ago or so, a friend of mine I had read one of my nonfiction books, Popular Science and Other Fiction books, about Solar Sail. I wrote a book about that. It did pretty old awesome meet in nature. And, and so well, not, it's not a textbook, but it's, it's all about saying. And he uh, had just sold his first novel to Bay and Books, and that was Travis Taylor. And I had worked with Travis previously on space projects on solar sails. And he had just sold his first novel to Bay, and we were talking at a science fiction convention about exploration and uh, how we might go back to the moon one day. And it turns out that his publisher, uh, Tony Weisskopf, who's the publisher of Brand Books, and he's actually in the booth next to us at the Harvard team. Right? And she leaned over to her new author, Travis, and said, Travis, he must send me a book proposal. I might be interested. So we did. And uh, the book, Back to the Moon, that Travis and I co wrote, uh, was we just success and wrote a sequel called Honor the Asteroid, the last bird of Dan Mollett, right? Okay. So, all right, popular science. Uh, uh, books like the one, The Traveler's Guide, which will be my best selling book so far, actually. It was published by Princeton Press last fall. Uh, it's the first book I've had that's been translated into five different languages, which I'm super excited about. And uh, my science fiction books sell well enough at Bayon that they keep coming back for more. <laughs> I've got a couple more in the works, including another book with Travis. I've uh, got two books with Travis, actually, for Bayon. And the latest, of course, is the one we just mentioned, which is just an anthology to lots of teeth from the age. Our project. So that's kind of how it all came about. And what, what the, the key factor of that is, my goal now is to find many games. I, I really want to help tech those kids in middle school, college age, young people, uh, get them thinking positively about the future, get them interested in science and each year, and get them to contribute to the next generation. And I think I do that, or I try to do that, so with podcasts like this, or writing books, we're going to science fiction conventions and giving talks and lectures for the public. I just want to let people know that tomorrow doesn't have to be worse off than today. Tomorrow can be better. And uh, people can roll up their sleeves and make it. So that's my story. Well, that is a nice story. Uh, it is true that inside every scientist is a nerd. Uh, it seems like you see these surveys every now and then that will we'll look at uh, faculty or they'll look at people who are working in the science field. They'll ask some questions so like, what inspired you to go down their path? And you know, some of the most common top answers, of course, are things like Star Trek, uh, Star Wars is another one up there. Uh, it, is, it really is fascinating. It kind of puts a smile on my face when I think about, wow, you know, these the work by these people who are in the world of fiction, how they inspired so many people to try to take that and make that reality. I, I just think that's one of those fascinating, uh, cool, positive things that has come out of geekery. That was kind of, it sounds like that was kind of what it was for you too. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's directly traceable to Gene Roddenberry and George Lucas. 
And, and then on the fiction side, Isaac Asimov, Robert Heinlein, Ben Bova, Larry Niven, uh, just fantastic. Uh, Marion Zimmer Bradley, Ursula Le Guin. Uh, wow. Uh, <laughs> and, and meeting those folks, getting their autograph. I've got about a stack of autograph books over here. I'm, I'm total fan of uh, if he's conventional, he's from the Rhinos part of the And even to the other, right? Some of the great writers today, I, I, I really want to be Stephen Baxter. I haven't had the opportunity to do that yet. Um, a lot of writers, I just really enjoy their stuff and look forward to getting a chance to meet on the talk to them. Yeah, absolutely. It's been fun. I know from the Patrick Childs, we mentioned it in the film. I uh, love the work of Chet Gannon. Chap is just a great writer. I really enjoy this stuff. Uh, there are a lot of good clips in it. They're writing inspiring, entertaining science fiction. Is there anything right now that you're you're into, like you're watching? So have you like watched the newest season of Picard, which is pretty good? Is there any uh, stories or books that you're really into at the moment? Well, I really, really like uh, the books that are at the basis of the experience. Um, I haven't watched The Expanse because basically it's too close to the books, and I love the books. Leviathan Waits by uh, the two guys who write as James S. A. Corey. Uh, it was really, it was really funny because I started reading that book, mine, which was a mistake uh, because I didn't want to go to bed. I was afraid I was going to miss something. <laughs> Which I could write that well. Um, so I'm really into that. And as far as shows go, oh my God, uh, Star Trek Strange New Worlds. That has to yeah. be the Star Trek since the original Star Trek. And I love The Mandalorian. Um, I'm, I'm not as huge a Star Wars fan, but boy, if they're all as good as The Mandalorian, I'll be back in it. Uh, you know, I mean, that's just been a great, a great show. Um, if you like Dystopic, which I don't generally like, I would hate to show up if it had a positive ending. Fortunately, I won't give anything away. It did have a positive ending. It was called The Dark. It's a German series that's on Netflix. Yes, I have seen that, yeah. Uh, it, well worth investing your time in. It's time travel done right. And uh, again, if it had a dystopic ending, I would never recommend it, but it did. And so I would recommend people maybe check that out on Netflix. It's, it's, it's really well written. Yeah, it's like, a, it's like a bit more scientific adult version of Stranger Things to describe people who haven't seen it. it. It really is good, though. It is worth your time. Maybe not like something to watch with the kids, per se. No, but... it's heavy for that. No, yeah. no, no. no. Uh, and you have to be in the mood for it. But I'll, I'll tell you, I got booked. And I got booked seriously booked at the end of season one and season two. And I really, really loved the whole story. Arc. And the ending was just phenomenal. It's well worth watching about way. It makes me feel a little better, though, to hear you say that you know you have to be careful not reading at night because then you won't you won't go to bed on time. You'll be tired in the morning. I have this problem often, so it's glad that me, a rather undisciplined person, uh, at least has this common with uh, you. And you're right. Strange, uh, strange new world is pretty good. I think there's been a lot of great sci-fi shows in the last five years. I think you would like the Expanse. Uh, they didn't they didn't adapt all the books so far they kind of end right before they get more into the stuff with aliens um but what for what it is it is pretty good i think overall you will you'll enjoy that because i've read the books i've seen the show i probably will watch it eventually when the go fresh in my den but I, I read the books and i started watching it and i knew everything that was going to happen it was oh, like uh, yeah okay I, I understand what you mean i need yeah. to need to wait until later and you know as a writer my goal is to have that page teller to teach you up at one right so I'm going to continue striving for that as a, as a science fiction writer. Um, and I, I just really have a great admiration for, for authors who can take me. Uh, I, I find it inspiring from a, from a literary point of view, from a writing point of view. But I also like just good storytelling because, you know, good storytelling was people overcoming obstacles uh, to, to get out of a problem or to fix a problem or to make a wrong right. And uh, I, I love that kind of thing uh, because I... I believe that's, you know, that's the striving of life, right? And mm -hmm. so I'm going to get preaching for a minute. I'm going to tell all your listeners, you don't read dystopian literature. If it's got a down or an ending, leave it on the shelf, unpurchased, right? We need people who are going to be thinking about problems and inspired by how to solve those problems, not people in general. Um, so uh, I, I, I am not a big fan of dystopian literature. There was a, a way that was into dystopian fiction in the, the 2010s. I think post-COVID, a lot of that interest has died down. I would still around some, but I don't think people are quite as into it as they used to be. What does your 
what do you, what, one, what do your coworkers think of your book writing and being an author? And what, what does your family think? Do they read your books? Do they ever have comments for you on that? Um, I don't know. I think my, well, my, my, my kids aren't really into science fiction all that much. They're young adults. I say kids, you know, they're in their films and urban burdens. Uh, neither one of them is a big science fiction fan. They've been mm-hmm. supportive. I have read a few of my books, not all of them. Uh, my wife uh, has read parts of the books, but she's also not a big science fiction fan. She's very supportive of what I do. She loves conventions and talking about the future, but just doesn't read much of that kind of literature. Um, and that's okay. I'm fine with that. Now, my coworkers have been surprisingly supportive. Um, they are enthusiastic about it, and I think they like the idea of the work that they're doing being popularized so that people might get a better appreciation of what they do. Because even, you know, I have to tell you, what I do is a great job, but it's still a job sometimes. And you do the garage sometimes. And they get it meetings, issues, and budgets, and, you know, difficult people that you have to deal with. You know, it's still this thing called work, right? And one of the things that help makes it tolerable is, A, you think about what you're doing and how exciting it is. And B, when it launches, it makes it all worth it, okay? But at the same time, when they're in the middle of it, to know that people on the outside are looking in and saying, hey, the, the general stuff that they're doing, advancing space technology for a better future, that's a bit for it. And uh, I think the science fiction writing, hopefully, is an outreach, which is not the reason I do it. Uh, for work purposes, I want to, like I said, I want to inspire many people out there and entertain people. But I also wanted to learn something and gain an appreciation for the rest of us I, I, When you said that your family doesn't really read your books, I can relate. This seems to be something I've noticed a lot with creatives. It's like they'll work on these big projects and maybe they might even be famous to people uh, out there outside their family, but then like they're, they're actual family members of like, they don't read it. They don't listen. They don't watch. I don't know why that is. That's kind of true for my my own family circle as well. Um, my mom sometimes reads and listens to my stuff, so that's nice. But that's about as far as it goes. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's maybe it's too close. So people... Familiarity, family. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, to get biblical on you, prophets have never accepted in the jail, right? I think that <laughs> familiarity kind of makes it think what. I know this person. I know all the terrible things they've done. I remember when they failed that assignment. How can they possibly write a book somebody wants to read? Um, I think that's, and, and I don't think that's a conscious thing. It's just you're familiar with they know me, you know? And uh, I don't know. It doesn't bother me in the least. They're all supportive. That's what came up. Um, True. And, and, I, and I really appreciate it. <laughs> Well, uh, Les, this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate you taking the time to come on the show. Uh, where can people find your book? Where can they find you online if they want to follow uh, your work, your talks, your writings, et cetera? Sure. Uh, I have a website, lesjohnsonauthor.com, all one word, lesjohnsonauthor, L-E-S-J-R-H-N-S-O-N-E-G-H-N-R.com, which is the Dan Show. That would be great. Um, I am on LinkedIn as Les Johnson one I got in early. <laughs> well, lots of Les Johnsons out there. Um, I am on Facebook. I have my personal page as well as a fan page. I have to warn people that there's also a Les Johnson author on Facebook who is an expert in fly fishing. That is not me. <laughs> I'm the space guy, not the fly fisher. So if you search for the other on Amazon or otherwise, um, my books are all widely available. Uh, they are published in physical book format. Uh, uh, Bayon is distributed by Simon & Schuster, so you can find it at Barnes & Noble. Just about any major bookstore you can order on Amazon. My audiobooks are on Audible, um, and they're e-books and Kindle, Apple Bookstore, uh, uh, all these yeah. are so many. They're all generally available. Yeah, the other Les Johnson, Les Johnson on YouTube is like a hunting channel. I think he has like 50,000 subs. I wonder if it's the same person as yeah, the fly it is. Fisherman. He's an outdoorsman, and he might be a, <laughs> and a fisherman. And given how many viewers he has compared to me, I may have picked the wrong field to call that YouTube or, or, or Facebook with, because apparently going hunting and fishing is a lot more popular than thinking about space is going to <laughs> Just Just a little bit, just a little bit. <laughs> 
well less this was a lot of fun thank you for for coming on the show um we're gonna wrap it up here guys a uh, quick shout out to my editor chris holowicki for uh, working on the podcast and helping make this whole show possible thanks again to the organizations young voices and of course bain books who help uh produce and publish this podcast and of course thank you to all you listeners and viewers and until next time my friends keep geeking out.